Do we have any questions from the audience? Um, I'd like to ask you, Deanna, I don't know if you can speak, I know it's hard to speak on behalf of your colleagues, other state AIDS, AIDS directors. Some of us uh, work in an AIDS policy group com uh, that's a combination effort between UCSF and UCLA, and we work closely with our advocates. We ourselves are not advocates because we're University of California employees, but um, one of their strategies has been to sort of build a firewall around ADAP. California is very, very generously resourced in terms of aid services. It, prevention was cut significantly in 2009, but in many ways we're in much better shape than a lot of other states. But one of the strategies the advocates have undertaken is to sort of build a firewall around ADAP. Is that something that you would consider or your colleagues? If all, if Wait, all else goes... I'm that sorry. that's what that that's what gets saved if everything else if the uh, sort of the predictions that Dr. Martin outlined here if worse comes to worse is it ADAP is what's the final line? And are, are Kevin? Are you referring directly more to the legislation? Exactly. As far as the passage. The legislation and the situation in in different states because you're dependent. You don't. You haven't been able to get state legislature funding, but many other states have. And what they do is if they can only get X amount of funding, is it ADAP that they would choose to protect? Hmm. I, I mean, I, I would think that um, it's true. I mean, I'm in a little, little bit of a different situation from my own state about that. Um, but I certainly think that, that ADAP is a high, high priority among uh, advocates and, and communities as far as being able to say, is this the top priority? I, you know, and I, um, Actually, Randy, Randy, do you mind if, uh, if, if, do you want to make a comment? I'm sorry, Randy is a state AIDS director from Iowa. I'm going to put you on the spot as far as <laughs> if you potentially want to add to that. Well, okay, I will, yeah, I'll speak for Iowa quickly. Um, we've had two waiting lists. Each were 14 months. And although most of the people are in the South, I, I, you know, I do want to point out that there are a number of low incident states, and really the low incident states were the first ones to come on with waiting lists, and, and some of the others have come on later. So if you look at Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, Iowa, we all had waiting lists very early on. Um, and a, one thing that doesn't get conveyed and that HRSA doesn't really seem to look at is exactly what are your eligibility criteria to begin with and then do you have a waiting list? For, an, for example, in Iowa, it's 200% a federal poverty level. Nobody is lower than that. Nobody is more restrictive. And we are continuously battling with waiting lists. And you know, some of the states are getting some of this ADAP relief money that is available for states that have cost containment strategies. But their cost containment is that they're going from 400% of FPL down to 350. And they're, you know, accessing the same money that we're fighting for. So I think HRSA needs to do a better job of looking across the United States and saying, what are the, what's the standard level that everybody should have in place, including a formulary? So our formularies are, you know, ours is very small. We have a couple antidepressant drugs, and that's about it, other than antiretrovirals. So I think that's also a big problem. And I don't know how HRSA needs to address that, but we just turned in our RFI for the new emergency relief. And they don't ask those kinds of questions. They don't really say, what's, what's your eligibility? What's your formulary look like? What are you already doing that way? And then you know, determining your money based upon that. So that's, you know, I, I just think they need to think differently about how the money is being distributed. The difficulty is, as you've said, some of the states have state money. Um, we have half a million that we fought for and that we have to fight for every single legislative session because they always try to take it away. And so we've managed to maintain it over time. But Thanks, Randy. Thank you very much. Nina? Hi, I'm Nina Harawa from Charles Street University. Given your experience, Dr. Gruber, and your research, Dr. Martin, and even um, Dr. Myers, I was curious what your perspectives on PrEP as prevention were. I mean, I realize that's not the topic of this, but I would be very interested in your perspective given your experiences. Um, you know, I, I think that, that certainly right now our focus is on um, the, the critical drugs of antiretrovirals, uh, primarily of getting those out to individuals living with HIV. And, and um, I know that last year our prevention manager and I talked 
quite a bit about uh, identifying some different funding in order to then establish some, some money for PrEP and to pursue that. Um, and we were unable to do that at the time, but it still is something that we're continuing to look at because, and, and, and even as the two of us started talking and sharing that with other, uh, other staff people and a few other partners or clinicians in the community, I think we were, um, we, we certainly got some pushback as far as, you know, what do you, what do you, are you crazy? You just closed the ADAP program and now you're gonna go and, uh, you know, and, and so it, it, it certainly does come with its level of, uh, of, of controversy about it. And, but I, I do feel that it, you know, it, it's an important, it's, an, it's one of those tools in the toolkit that have, have been talked about throughout the day. And I don't think that we should rule any of those out. Arlene? Um, thank you for mentioning the Accountable Care Act and how it actually will provide a lot of relief to Ryan White programs. Um, but it's a kind of double-edged sword because the timing is really unfortunate in that legislators may decide that we don't need Ryan White because everyone's going to be covered. But that isn't true because certain groups of people are uh, legislatively um, prohibited from using either um, Medicaid or uh, subsidies under the insurance exchanges, and those are the undocumented. Have you begun discussions about what you would do uh, to cover the undocumented in that situation? Are, are there any options? Well, this sort of feeds into, I've been actually hassling a lot of uh, ADAP directors this summer um, <laughs> to talk about this very issue of you know, what's happening in different states with rolling out the Affordable Care Act. Um, and one of the things that people do mention a lot is this issue of the undocumented. Um, and they talk about it in different ways. Um, so certainly people say that this is an issue because um, undocumented and also recent immigrants are really excluded from all the provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and what might happen is in a high incident state or a state with high immigrant populations, that might make it pretty obvious that ADAP is being used to cover this population, which might in turn make the program a huge political target. Um, it's not really clear what's gonna happen though. But I think very similar, it, yes, of, of pointing out the fact that currently with ADAP, um, you know, we are able to, to cover uh, undocumented individuals because of their residency status, not because of their citizenship. And, but we also do feel like some of that, how much, how much do individuals really know that at the higher levels in our, uh, you know, in the political arena? And so I think that it is, it, we're, we're, we, we don't have the answer, I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> Thank you. But. Deanne, I recall too after um, Katrina that you had a large influx of yes. undocumented too because of the building and construction trades and everything. Right, and, and I think that, that was the, of working with our public hospital system, Louisiana has a very unique public hospital system where we have 10 hospitals administered by LSU and, and they are then administered then at the state versus at the county level, which is a lot of other uh, types of jurisdictional administration of, of public services. And we were, we had to work very closely with our LSU hospital because it, they had their own, you know, some of their own rules that were coming in related to eligibility and whether individuals who had come to assist in gutting houses and rebuilding um, and yet had no documentation, um, could, could they get care and services? And I remember uh, that we, we did, we were able to make a, a bit of arrangements for, for, those, for those individuals. I, and again, I'm not gonna disclose a whole lot because, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> we understand. Steve? Steve Morin, I'm director of the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies at UCSF. Um, uh, thank you for these comments because they help put the whole test and treat discussion in a much more realistic context. In order to uh, test and actually get people in long-term treatment with viral suppression and the maximum number of people virally suppressed, it's going to cost money. And what your uh, talk is pointing out is what we've known for a long time is uh, there was a lot of discussion about disparities this morning, but the greatest disparities in the United States are across state borders. 
and the states that have chosen to uh, tax themselves to raise resources for the collective good have been able to invest a lot more in um, healthcare infrastructure for uh, the poor uh, and disadvantaged, whereas the states, particularly the ones that are fighting healthcare reform in the courts, uh, also have political structures that do not allow for the uh, resources at the local level to, to um, make a difference so that you avoid the waiting list and you get the maximum number of people uh, on therapy. It's, it's interesting, uh, in this test and treat discussion, which has been going on and really intensified in the Rome conference, so little attention has been placed on what needs to be done in terms of um, managing the resources and in a time of limited resources, how would you implement in the most efficient ways so that you uh, can accomplish the maximum number of uh, people uh, link, uh, tested, detected, linked, retained, and virally suppressed? It's, and these issues around mental health and, and um, substance abuse are all part of the picture that have to go into these multi-level approaches which are just going to cost money. So I think what we're thinking about is how do you um, put together a group that tries to think through not the um, efficacy or even the effectiveness in real world situations, but the efficiency uh, issues of how you would construct a system to actually do this. So I can comment on this from an interstate perspective. Um, so I've spent way too much time looking at uh, uh, federal Ryan White allocations to states and thinking about which states are getting more or less money. Does this actually match political arguments that are going on in Congress? Um, I also did some analysis thinking about um, what are the factors over time that lead a state to get more or less money. Um, since 1990, when uh, Ryan White was implemented, there have been several key legislative changes to the allocation formula. Um, and I have found that despite all these changes um, to the formularies, despite changes in underlying needs such as um, HIV incidents moving to different populations, the single most important predictor of what a state gets today in terms of dollar per case allocation is what the state got in the first five years of the okay, program. Just take one more question. That's not to say that legislators haven't tried really hard to change the allocation formulas. Um, a lot of it has to do with there are hold harmless provisions and no new money has been allocated. So you, the other challenge is that it's hard to decide what is a fair distribution of funds. So you can take people, think about San Francisco and New York as being two places that were early epicenters. Um, maybe they unfairly have more money dollar per case in other places. But on the other hand, they're providing a certain level of services for pretty high numbers of people living with HIV. So is it fair to pull away money from those jurisdictions and leave those people without services to move it somewhere else? Um, there's a lot of these kinds of questions, and I think that's part of what makes this dialogue so difficult, is that it's very political. There's different ways to define need, fairness. Um, so. All set. We have time for one more quick question, Barry. Yeah, pe people with HIV in prisons in the South have actually gotten, uh, in, the care and treatment has actually been improved as a result of some lawsuits in the South. Um, we also know that one of the biggest predictors of continuity of care post-release from incarceration is, the, um, is uh, applying for ADAP pre-release from custody. So my, my question is, is, what is happening with those states for people who are actually getting care and treatment in prisons and jails, and then get, and they're on, the, and for, when, on biological markers, viral load, CD4 counts, they're actually being released in quite a healthy state, in a healthy state. What's happening with them when they get out, when they're released from prison as far as ADAP? Um, I, for, for Louisiana, uh, we've worked very closely with our Department of Corrections and we have a um, correction specialist who has, I guess, been working for about five years uh, that she works with inmates who are then scheduled to be released and works with them for about um, 60 to 90 days before their release and then, yeah, helps to kind of transition them into 
uh, into services and medical care upon their release. And as far as ADAP, uh, before we closed the program to new enrollment, that was part of the process, is that before they left, and then the paperwork was, was completed and it was confirmed of where they were going to be relocating and, and that kind of thing. Since, uh, since then, and then it's pretty much been of assessing, and since we have it closed now to new enrollment, and then we, she works with getting them onto patient assistance programs, primarily through the pharmaceutical companies. Which is pretty much what, you know, the 960 individuals who are still on our wait list, um, it, that is what's happening with them too, is that they are then being enrolled onto patient assistance programs. Is that something that's, you know, cross state? Could you speak, I mean, are other jurisdictions also, that's what they're doing? Okay. Yes. Thank you. I mean, I don't know across every state, but I do know a number of states that are doing that. Well, we'd like to thank both of you very much for your presentation. Thank you. We're going to take a quick five-minute break before Dr. Diefenbach speaks.